Hi, and welcome to this talk on Spark, Kubernetes, and VMware vSphere. My name is Justin Murray, and I'll be introducing my co-speaker in one second. And we're very glad to be here at the Spark AI Summit 2020. Uh, our title today is Simplify and Boost Apache Spark Deployments with Hypervisor Native Kubernetes. Well, that's quite a mouthful, but we're going to be talk talking here about a very tight link between Kubernetes and the VMware hypervisor as a basis for running Apache Spark. So my co-speaker on the next slide is Enrique Coro, and I'll ask Enrique to introduce himself briefly here. Thank you, Justin. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Enrique Coro. I work for the Office of the CTO at VMware as a data science engineer, and I'm super happy to be here with Justin and all of you. Thank you. Thanks again. And uh, I belong to the cloud services business unit within VMware, which is actually uh, running vSphere technology, our core hypervisor technology on uh, VMware cloud on AWS, which we'll mention briefly here, as well as running it on premises. And uh, that'll be a little novelty in this talk for you here. So let's move to the next one. Okay, so what's our motivation for this talk? Uh, VMware, as you know, has been in business for about 20 years or so and has really served the needs of the IT administrator, to be quite frank. We've given scalable infrastructure, uh, hybrid cloud infrastructure, and by that I mean both on-premises and in the cloud, on VMware Cloud, on AWS, and on other uh, hyperscalers. We've given that infrastructure for years and made it easy to manage and easy for users to consume that infrastructure. But we know there's a community of developers out there um, on the next section. And those developers really need a place to build their applications that is a reliable, scalable, and cost-efficient way to do that. And largely, developers and DevOps people are building containers today. So they're using tools of their own to do that. And the major platform on which you're running containers is Kubernetes. So, this talk really centers around running Spark and Kubernetes together, which you could argue is displacing Hadoop from its traditional big data role. But what we've done here in the vSphere 7 release is integrated those Kubernetes services that you see on the bottom left here with all of the other services that you find, network services, compute services, storage services. They're all first-class citizens in VMware. Now Kubernetes is a first-class citizen as well. It's tightly integrated into the control plane of VMware. And the idea is to integrate and harmonize the infrastructure for both the administrator and the developer. So that the developer can say to uh, a, a vSphere environment, give me a Kubernetes cluster, please. I want to use that for about a week or two. I want to build my application and deploy it into Kubernetes. And then I want to tear it down. And put it into production on an even different Kubernetes cluster. So all of that is now on target for VMware vSphere. And I'm going to hand over to my colleague Enrique to describe that in more detail. Enrique. Thank you, Justin. Okay, I'm going to, talk, I'm going to start by talking about VMware vSphere with Kubernetes, which is a renewed VMware platform designed to bridge the gap between infrastructure and application development. Um, we have that from version seven, vSphere incorporates Kubernetes as a series of native processes within the hypervisor. This allows the rapid provisioning of developer services, such as the container runtime and registry, networking and persistent storage volumes. All these services are consumable from the standard Kubernetes API, which is very important for developers nowadays. The integration of Kubernetes and the hypervisor improves the vSphere administrator productivity and allows IT operations teams to focus on crucial infrastructure attributes such as performance, security, availability, cost, and troubleshooting. At the same time, DevOps teams get self-service environments that allow them to code, test, and deploy, and support modern applications with great agility. Please consider that uh, the container orchestration approach offered by Kubernetes also applies to Spark, which is officially supported, <coughs> sorry, which is officially supporting Kubernetes as an orchestrator from Spark 3 version. Now, 
I will talk about VMware Tansu, a new platform designed to build, run, and manage modern applications such as Spark on top of properly managed enterprise-grade Kubernetes platforms. At the heart of VMware Tansu, we have the Tansu Kubernetes Grid, also known as TKG. The Tansu Kubernetes Grid provides a consistent upstream compatible implementation of Kubernetes, which gets tested, signed, and supported by VMware. You can deploy Tansu Kubernetes Grid across your vSphere clusters and also across Amazon EC2 instances. We are working to extend TKG support uh, for more public cloud providers besides AWS. Uh, we, we also are planning to support uh, more Kubernetes uh, flavors in the future. The Tansu Kubernetes Grid has a native awareness of uh, multi-cluster paradigms. And this allows you to, to manage any number of um, Kubernetes clusters from a centralized loca location, which has uh, many administra administration advantages. Here, the illustration of how IT operations teams can manage their Tansu Kubernetes cluster from the vSphere 7 web user interface. On the left panel, you can see the hierarchical organization of the data center. Following a top down order, we find the physical hosts grouped by vSphere clusters. Inside this, we see a new grouping component called namespaces. You can think about a namespace as a pool of resources dedicated to run one or multiple Tansu Kubernetes clusters. The right panel shows the details about the status and number of Kubernetes clusters running on the cloud infrastructure. The panel also shows the, cap the capacity allocated for the namespace and how much of the allocated resources are being used. To simplify the deployment of the of operations of vSphere 7 and Tansu Kubernetes clusters, VMware has put all the infrastructure pieces together within the hyper-converged platform called VMware Cloud Foundation 4.0. Here, a, a, a bird-eye view of the physical architecture of the platform. You can deploy Cloud Foundation on a wide range of supported vendors. In, in the past two years, we have worked with Intel to develop a hybrid cloud data analytics solution that leverages different Intel acceleration technologies for machine learning and big data. Spark may greatly benefit from these uh, hardware components to see incremental performance gains. Cloud Foundation integrates the computing, networking, and storage layers of the hybrid cloud infrastructure following a standardized validated architecture. This architecture gets automatically deployed and life cycle using the series of management components included with the solution. On the left side of the, the left side of the picture, we see the operations module of Cloud Foundation called the management domain. From that point, IT operations gets all the tools needed to operate a hybrid cloud environment, including the Tansu Kubernetes clusters, as shown on the right side of the picture. Development teams such as data engineering and data science can take control of the Kubernetes resources using standard APIs. Here we see a typical view of an end-to-end -end analytics pipeline with Apache Spark at the core. With Kubernetes clusters available for developers, it is possible to deploy many open source applications using the Bitnami Helm charts. If you are not familiar with Helm, you can think of it as an open source package management solution for Kubernetes. Helm charts allow you to deploy and remove software using very simple command line instructions. As a complement, Bitnami continuously monitors and updates uh, a catalog of more than 130 open source applications to ensure development stacks and are always up to date and secure. Here we show part of the catalog of open source technologies offered by Bitnami. As you can see on the right, Apache Spark is also part of it. Now let's see how all this works together in a brief demo. Here an overview of the demo plot. First, we will explore the new Kubernetes in the vSphere interface designed to manage Kubernetes resources. Then we will deploy a new Kubernetes cluster using the command line interface 
and we will verify the status of this newly created cluster. Then we will explore the Vietnamese Helm Charts catalog, which includes a, par a chart for Apache Spark. Next, we'll deploy Apache cluster using the Helm Chart. Finally, we'll verify the functionality of the newly created Spark cluster. OK, let's explore the new Kubernetes capabilities incorporated in the vSphere 7 management interface. Here, a view of the, of the cloud infrastructure components. At the top, we have the data center objects uh, and the typical resources they manage. Within the data center object, we see a new element called namespaces, which aggregates the Kubernetes clusters. From the namespace view, you can monitor the status of the Kubernetes components, the number of cluster deployments, and the resource capacity that the Kubernetes clusters are consuming. Now, let's deploy a Kubernetes cluster name K8 for Spark using just one TKG command. We, here we see the TKG create cluster command. In this case, it is running in dry run mode, so we can verify the cluster specification before being built. The specification defines things like the Kubernetes version to be used, the configuration of the network and storage services, and the number of control plane and worker pods that will support the cluster operation. Now let's run the TKG command for real to spin up the new cluster. Notice that a manual deployment of Kubernetes can take a good bunch of commands. And here we only need to run just one command to do the job. Wait for a moment and the new Kubernetes cluster for Spark gets created. Now we can use the TKG get command to query the status of the new cluster. We do this several times until we see that the control plane and the two worker pods are reported as running. Now let's verify the Kubernetes cluster operation by deploying a couple of Nginx pods on it. It is time to use the kube control command to deploy Nginx from a YAML file. Once kube control gets executed, we get confirmation that the Nginx pods got deployed. Then we use kube control a couple of times to query the Nginx pods status until they get reported as running. Now let's meet the Vietnamic catalog of Helm charts, which includes ch charts for Apache Spark. Vietnami provides a catalog of curated containers and Helm charts for dozens of open source applications with Apache Spark included. Here we see the options available to deploy Spark either on Docker or on Kubernetes. If we click on the readme file, it takes us to the GitHub repository for the Spark Helm chart. Here we can see an example of the two Helm commands required to deploy Spark on Kubernetes. We can also see that the deployment can be customized by modifying the Spark charts configuration parameters. The list of parameters includes things like the image registry, the network service uh, port numbers, CPU and memory allocations for the master and workers, and the number of worker replicas. There is a total of 97 parameters available to tailor the deployment to your needs. Now, let's deploy Apache Spark on the Kubernetes cluster previously created for this purpose. We will fully install Spark using only two Helm commands. We start by adding the Vietnamese charts repository to the local Helm records. Next, we proceed to run the Helm install command to make, it, to make a new deployment call Spark K8. After several seconds, we get confirmation that Spark got deployed. We are given some references about how to launch the web UI and also how to submit jobs. Next, we use kube control to verify that the Spark pods are working. We keep doing this until we see that the master and the workers are all up and running. Then we switch to web UI to verify the, Sp the Spark's stat state from this interface. Let's give it a second. We see that no applications are running and not completed uh, because the, the cluster is new. And we also confirm that the cluster status is alive. 
Finally, let's verify the, that the Spark cluster deployed on Kubernetes is operational by executing a job. Here we use the cube control execute command to submit a pi number estimation job available from the examples jar file that comes with Spark. The estimation task gets launched for a total of 100 iterations. When iterations get complete, the result is printed in the screen, as you can see. Then we switch back to the Spark Web UI and we verify the status of the last application. We click on the app ID and verify that, that the job state is finished, which indicates that the job concluded in a normal way. So now that we've seen how to deploy Spark on Kubernetes, let's uh, take the testing up a little bit into heavier workloads. And we did that in our performance engineering lab. And I'm going to describe that now. So this is testing Spark on Kubernetes for performance. So we wanted to test Spark on Kubernetes versus Spark standalone, that is Spark running outside of a Hadoop, outside of Yarn, just using the Spark cluster manager uh, to manage it. So we had the same setup of hardware for both of these, same virtual machines, same hardware, same conditions, same test suite. But in one test, we were running Spark standalone. And in the subsequent test, we were running Spark on Kubernetes. And we were trying to find, would there be any impact, impact on performance? And also trying to see what benefits do we get from Spark running on Kubernetes? And as I mentioned before, Kubernetes is, is a resource manager. So it's largely taking the place of legacy big data systems here. Um, so here's the architecture of Spark on Kubernetes, as you see here. In this case, we were running the Spark submit not to the Spark master, but to the API server in Kubernetes, which is now acting as the resource manager. And we ran the Spark driver, a little bit different to this diagram, we ran the Spark driver on the same virtual machine as the, Spark, as the Kubernetes master. But the, the executors were being spun up on the fly on the Spark submit command. So you'll see this a bit more in the next slide. Um, so this is just the, the same picture blown up. So you can choose whether your Spark driver runs in a pod in, a, in, in your Kubernetes cluster or in the Spark cluster, or you can run your driver on the client side. That's called client mode. And we actually use client mode here, uh, but the, the functionality was the same. Client mode allows you to execute remotely from your Kubernetes cluster and driver or cluster mode would allow you to run the driver within your cluster and have everything together. So the, the communication that you're going on here to say schedule a pod, et cetera, that's all being done within the same virtual machine in our Kubernetes case here. But the executors are running in pods and they're being fired up on the fly here. So next slide. So this is the architecture at the hardware level and at the software level all in one. And the four rows here, host one to host four, represent four second generation Intel Xeon Cascade Lake servers, quite powerful servers with two uh, uh, sockets in each one, Intel Platinum 8260 and 2.4 gigahertz. With hyperthreading on, which we'd recommend, you have 96 logical cores or hyperthreads and 768 gigabytes of memory. So decent sized machines here, but not the biggest machines in the world by any means. On each of those, we ran four Spark worker virtual machines. And on the first host, we ran the Spark master and Spark driver together. As I mentioned, the Spark driver is now uh, outside the cluster to some extent. So Spark, for, the, for the Spark master VM, we had eight virtual CPUs and 64 gigs of memory, quite a small virtual machine actually. And for the Spark workers, we gave them a little more power. They had 16 virtual CPUs or vCPUs and 120 gigs of memory each. And so in total on the first host, we had four times 120, that's 480 gigs for the workers and another 64 for the Spark master making 544 gigs allocated on that first host. Now we're going to fill those empty slots on host two, three and four in when we deploy Kubernetes onto this. And that's going to be the next picture that you'll see. Remember the same hosts, the same virtual machines in, in all cases. Uh, it's just now that instead of being just a Spark worker, the individual VMs, the four VMs that are uh, look alike on each host are now Kubernetes workers. 
So same hardware, but this time we have three Kubernetes masters. This is to simulate a highly available system. And we have an HA proxy running on host four there in the first VM. So we had three extra, we have, we have three extra virtual machines in this case in the first slot on each host. And uh, these, these Kubernetes uh, workers, same size VMs, uh, the, the masters had eight virtual CPUs, the workers had 16. And notice in red on the bottom left hand side, one virtual machine represents one Kubernetes worker. And we assigned one Spark executor pod to each worker node. And uh, one or more Spark executors, of course, can run inside an executor pod. So very simple design here, very uh, simple approach to doing this for uniformity across the two environments. So that's, that's how we set this up. Now, a few notes on the, on the next one. Um, Spark Submit, which we typically supply to the Spark master, it can call a Kubernetes master instead of a Spark master by putting K8S as the prefix to the URL or URI you give it. What we did in preparation for that was create a private namespace, just as you do in regular Kubernetes, which, which we call Spark. And then in that namespace, we created a service account, also called Spark, and we created a cluster role binding to allow that role uh, or that service account to actually edit and therefore create pods in the cluster within that namespace. So these are standard procedures that you would apply if you're setting up RBAC for your Kubernetes cluster, nothing unusual here. So um, we, used, we, we used cluster mode here, which is the Spark driver runs in the cluster. Uh, we also use client mode in other experiments. So both work fine on vSphere. Uh, next slide, please. So, these are the results of the tests. And this was ResNet 50, which is an image classification test running on top of Spark with Intel Big DL libraries uh, and a program written using Intel Big DL as the driver. Um, Enrique mentioned some uh, Intel software at the start. We worked closely with Intel on uh, increasing performance. Um, both, both running on the same machines with a varying number of virtual machines. Higher, higher is better on these charts. And the blue represents Spark standalone. The orange represents Spark and Kubernetes. As you can see, they're within 1% of each other. Now, the number of images per second here is very low because this is not GPU enhanced uh, deep learning. This is regular CPU based deep learning. And that's, uh, th that's an experiment to drive a lot of traffic through this rather than a test of deep learning. It's, a, it's trying to saturate the system as much as you can, we could. And you'll see that when we go to the next one. But my main point in this section is that performance is roughly the same whether you're on Spark standalone, just running in virtual machines, or Spark running in Kubernetes on virtual machines. OK, so having done that, we wanted to look at some other things. Uh, and here's the Kubernetes console. And the purpose of showing you this is really to show you under the CPU requests there that these CPUs are working very hard. They're at 95% and above. And also that you can use a standard Kubernetes dashboard to look at your virtualized Kubernetes, just as you would if it was running elsewhere. We also have a, a console of our own called Tanzu Mission Control. And the Tanzu brand that Enrique mentioned at the beginning is a whole family of products, including Tanzu Mission Control, that can look at your Kubernetes clusters, whether they're running on VMware vSphere or running in the cloud on AWS or running on VMware cloud on AWS. Any of those can be controlled by Tanzu Mission Control. OK, let's go to the next one. So having done that performance test, now we wanted to go back into training and say, could we use Spark for training on VMware? And uh, we, we took an example of a tool here, which does training, and took the output from that tool, which is a, a Java object. And you see this. Uh, set up here. Actually, this is in VMware Cloud on AWS. And the user interface, although I'm using the bright background rather than the dark background that Enrique was using, uh, you can tell this is VMware Cloud on AWS because right in the center of the screen, it shows you uh, the domain in which we're operating, which is US West. And on, on the top left-hand side, 
the address mentioned is vmwarevmc.com, which means this is VMware running on the public cloud on AWS hardware. And those uh, six machines on the top left hand side of the navigation with their IP addresses, 10 dot, et cetera, those are physical machines in an AWS data center running VMware vSphere. But the reason I highlighted the in red here is this is the virtual machine running the machine learning training tool that I'm going to show you in a second. It's not an unusual virtual machine. It's just got four virtual CPUs in it and uh, 50 gigs of memory. So it's not an un untypical virtual machine. It's quite a normal one. And we brought this across from on-premises without changing the virtual machine. We ran it on-premises and then run it, ran it on VMware Cloud and AWS as well. So here's the user interface to that tool. It's a very nice user interface. I'm not going to go through it in detail. This is H2O's driverless AI tool, which does training based on principally tabular data. And we wanted to show you two forms of data being processed here. Tabular data is very common in business. Image data is what a lot of deep learning is about, but a lot of business runs on tables. And this is tabular data for credit cards. And we're trying to predict whether somebody would default on their next payment. That's the left-hand column. But I'm not going to through the, through, go through the details of the training here. Instead, we're going to hit the deploy button on the, in the middle of the top there and generate a Java object from this training session and deploy it into Spark. So when we hit deploy, we get a Java object, which is in H2O's terminology, terminology called a model optimized Java object or a mojo. Having got that, uh, pipeline.mojo, you see it on the third line of the Docker file on your right-hand side there. We're going to copy that pipeline model optimized Java object, mojo. We're going to copy that into our container, and then we're going to run uh, a REST server in which this is going to execute, that, that pipeline is going to execute just for testing purposes, just to simulate the life of a data scientist here. So we created our Docker image, we tagged it, we pushed it to a repository. By the way, there's a repository inside VMware's Kubernetes as well called Harbor, part of the Tanzu family. And then we tested that Docker container on its own by simply doing a Docker run. But more interesting than that was deploying that same thing, that same container image, into Kubernetes. And you can see a Kubernetes kubectl apply there on the second from last line and the kubectl apply node port, which first one deploys the scorer that we've just uh, made into a Docker image. And the second one surrounds it with a node port so as we can get at it from outside the Kubernetes cluster. So this is simulating what a data scientist might do just to bring up a test in Kubernetes of their uh, future Spark object or future Spark container. So now let's move on to a more serious deployment of that in what's known as, uh, and this by the way is the REST server running and the lines at the bottom indicate that the prediction, the scorer is running. So this is Spring Boot executing a REST server within the container and being executed against the VM here. So. Now let's go back to Spark and H2O happens to have, have a flavor of their technology that works with Spark. It's called Sparkling Water, Sparkling H2O. And you see it here. And we deployed that same pipeline, that same model optimized Java object into Sparkling Water and into standalone Spark, both running under virtual machines with Kubernetes. So this proved to us that the end-to-end uh, -end from training right through to model deployment could be done on Spark on VMware. And Spark is typically used in training, but we used it here for inference as well as training just to show that that could be done. So that's sparkling water and standalone Spark. And finally here, what came out of that predictor or that scorer was the set of rows that you see in the middle of the screen and the set of rows that you see in the bottom of the screen they, they both have default payment next dot zero and dot one as their titles. Dot zero means no default for that particular uh, customer in the next month. Dot one means there is a potential for default for that customer in the next month. Just to show you the score actually working based on the uh, training that we did in H2O's tool, driverless AI at the beginning. And that, by the way, is among a set of tools for automated ML that we encourage our, our parties, our third party companies to work with us on. All right, so 
Now to conclude, what you saw from the very beginning from Enrique's section was a unified hybrid cloud platform. We call that VMware Cloud Foundation or VCF. It runs both on-premises and in VMware Cloud on AWS and other clouds. It gives you the, ability, the agility of Kubernetes with enterprise capabilities of vSphere. Many, many thousands of companies run VMware vSphere to support all, all their applications today. Now they can run Kubernetes on there in an integrated way and run Spark on top of Kubernetes. That gives a pretty compelling development and deployment system. Uh, Kubernetes definitely simplifies our methods of deployments of Spark. The uh, Spark workers came up with Spark automatically. In the Kubernetes case, they had to be installed in, in the standalone case with Spark itself. You can easily get started with Spark using the Bitnami Helm charts. Enrique showed you that in his demo. And then we went on to move to testing performance of Spark on VMs with and without Kubernetes. And they're about equal within 1% of each other. And Kubernetes definitely from our perspective is becoming the method of choice for deploying both the training and inference parts of machine learning. And both machine learning and deep learning applications, we've also tested deep learning applications on Kubernetes deploy very well onto vSphere, onto Kubernetes with vSphere. And just a reminder that the world is not all about deep learning. There's a lot of tabular structured data in the world that also should be an important part of your machine learning deployments. And we showed that in our demo here with the H2O tool. Okay. So all of what I described in the performance part is given in this first URL here. We'll come back to this URL so you can take a picture of it. Uh, there's a general blog site at VMware called blogs.vmware.com slash app slash ML for machine learning. You can find tons and tons of information there about how to use GPUs with VMware, how to do Spark on VMware. And we've also done a lot of testing of Hadoop and Spark together on VMware, as well as the standalone Spark that you saw earlier. And we've got many papers written about big data and v, uh, vSphere in general that you can see here in the last three references. Okay, so please give us your feedback. We, we welcome your feedback and questions and we look forward to your questions after we've done here. Um, please rate the session and review them for us so as we can improve this for the next time. We really appreciate your attention to us here. And so on behalf of my colleague, Enrique Coro Fuentes from uh, VMware's office of the CTO and Justin Murray here, thank you very much for your time and we'll, uh, we'll get your questions coming up. Thank you.